Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour, episode number 18, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, this week on the show, it's a bit of a Sega special, I think you could say, this week. Sega. <laughs> because we have got the man himself. Yes. The guy that pretty much ran the whole thing in its heyday. Yeah, well, made it successful as well, mm. you know. He was the guy that led the campaign against Nintendo. Tom Kalinske. Tom Kalinske, yeah. And the introduction of Sonic and, you know, all these great titles that really defined an era. Well, it was, you know, it was really Sega's most successful era, and Tom was the CEO all the way through that era. Yep. Um, and also, I mean, we, we've been doing a little bit more background research on Tom. He's a guy that came up with He-Man. Barbie as well. <laughs> yeah, which I know you're very uh, pleased about, to <laughs> ask him some Barbie questions. Yeah. So, uh, Tom Kalinske on the Retro Hour in the next 35 minutes or so, and um, get the inside story on Sega in their heyday. And also, it'd be quite interesting to find out what he thinks of them today as well, I think, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. And so, there's also a new movie coming up. There is, yeah. So we've timed this very well. Um, Seth Rogen, I think, is behind it. Is that yeah, right? yeah, yeah. He's uh, directing it, so... So, this yeah. is going to be big news, guys. Plenty of Sega on this week's show, and if we are sounding a little bit croaky at the moment, um, I must apologise. We have just got back from a rather large weekend. <laughs> yeah, it was in uh, Blackpool. We went to Play Blackpool. Yeah, Play Expo. What did you think then? I thought it was really good. I, I kind of enjoyed meeting up with other people more than the actual show itself. Mm. Um, there was some good stuff. We we went on this uh, virtuality, which was the first virtual reality from 1991 or something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it yeah. took me about two hours for my neck to recover because <laughs> it was so heavy. <laughs> well, these things, um, we did see it, was it last year in Wolverhampton? We yeah. saw it, but it wasn't working then, was it? Yeah, it was one pound a play this time. Yeah, <laughs> was it good. was like two quid back in the day, so that was a bargain. But um, these things are actually based on uh, like Amiga 3000 custom boards, aren't they? Yeah, I think you have an Amiga 3000 strapped to your back, basically. <laughs> <laughs> my back is still feeling like it now, actually, yeah. Um, but we played this um, game, I've been trying to find the name of it now, but I can't, it's something to do with something Raptor? Yeah, they they had it on Games Master once when they did early virtual reality stuff. And these guys, I think it was developed in Leicester, wasn't it? So yeah. not far away from us, but it's basically like a, a first-person shooter um, where it's like quick on the draw, really got to shoot. Oh, about other, six you? frames per second. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's amazing still. Like I kept getting picked up by this like Raptor thing and then drop down and then Ravi would shoot me in the head and then I just look down and see my arms explode in front of my body. So, yeah, uh, it's very strange as well because they had no sound. So yeah. you just had some guy from the museum shouting stuff at you like, move left, go You're up. You're dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was loads of fun. And we tried our Sociable Soccer. Really good, really good gameplay. I've never scored a goal in Sensible Soccer, but Sociable, yeah. Hey, you whooped me on it, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. And I think they had a, a, a rude uh, motto at the beginning towards FIFA, which is Oh, they did, good. yes, <laughs> yes, uh, which we won't repeat on a uh, family-friendly podcast. <laughs> but um, for those who might not be familiar with that, this is our John Hare um, from Sensible. He's behind it. It's basically the spiritual successor to Sensible Soccer. Yeah. And uh, by the looks of that, I mean, it was pretty much, you know, that looked like a finished product to me. Yeah, and we didn't get to see any of the guest talks, but... Um... He spoke down there. And, yeah, on uh, Sunday. Also Jim Bagley, mm -hmm. who we'd had on a couple of weeks ago. So we actually bumped into Jim in real life, which was great. Yeah, to me. and on the night we uh, were out with the guys from uh, RGDS and uh, Tenpence yeah. Arcade, they were there as well. Baz, who we've got to give a shout to, um, a loyal Amiga fan. Yeah, yeah, it was great. We uh, we went out to Blackpool, we ended up in a karaoke bar. <laughs> yeah, you may have seen a post where we're on about RGDS defecting to us. We are trying to cause a little bit of controversy. So. Yeah, sorry Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Fun. Yeah, loads of fun though, and uh, I think I can still still taste Jaeger bombs now. Oh, oh god! Not, not <laughs> yeah. but, um, but yeah, when's the next one on? Is it um, Manchester? Isn't it end of end of, uh, end of the summer? I think yeah, October. Yeah. So um, we'll probably be there. We will, no doubt. So what an amazing weekend, though. So if you did come and say hello, we did meet a few uh, podcast listeners at um, Play yeah. Blackpool over the weekend. Uh, thanks it's really for coming, nice. guys. And uh, there was that nice little display as well from the Retro Computer Museum that yeah. had the Commodore sixteen and a few Amiga things that got us interested. Yeah, <laughs> no. we're there like most of the afternoon, weren't we? Yeah, I must say we found out something when we came back which was quite disappointing which is soundcloud's rss feed has basically been dead for two days yeah so we were away for the weekend we released um an episode on friday night before we went away and uh then while we we're away we we're just getting all these like messages start coming up on on my phone going um you know is there something wrong with your episode lads are your servers down and we're like trying to access it remotely my laptop died over the weekend as well when we're yeah. in blackpool all running out of power on our phones as well so we're <laughs> yeah. a bit concerned and then uh, unfortunately it turns out yeah soundcloud's rss feed soundcloud the world the company that we pay um, yeah. to host our podcast and lots of other podcasts do worldwide as well so they're all out yeah so if you try to get us on pretty much any of the podcast clients that don't do a local like cash copy of it um, chances are you maybe didn't get last week's show. So, yeah. uh, and it was a good one as well. I mean, it we was, and ben it's David available Lynch. on YouTube, guys, as well. And it should be, hopefully, by the time this show's out, 
Yeah, well, fingers Unless crossed. Unless SoundCloud goes bust, it should yeah. be. Um... I think we'll have moved if it's not by yeah. this weekend. But um, So if you didn't li- listen to last week's show, maybe you had a problem downloading it. Um, I'd say give it a download because it was one of our best episodes, wasn't it? Oh, it was amazing. Really yeah. good. And Ben actually joined us for the news. Yeah. So, so we we had like an extra guest and then we got in depth with him. It was great. Yeah, one for the C64 heads last week. So oh, yeah, definitely. If you didn't manage to get it because of technical problems, give it another go. You should get it. Yeah. You, know, you can listen on the website, theretrohour.com. Right then, before Tom Kalinske, um, let's get into this week's stories then. This is quite interesting. Retro Arcade VR. Yeah, and it's even got the awful looking carpet to match it. <laughs> and, you know, cigarette butts everywhere. So this is essentially, um, you go into a virtual arcade environment. On This is on the HTC Vive. Um, so it's a VR, you put the VR headset on, obviously, and you're transported back to the 80s into uh, like a seaside yeah, arcade. Yeah, totally. And you can add new arcade stuff that, you know, they have Game Boys there that you could pick up. They've got Joust and all the old classic stuff, you know, like mm-hmm. you'll have a Frogger machine and uh, Arknoid and everything. And you just go up and play on it. Yeah. So yeah. You're walking around the arcade and you actually walk up to these like cabinets. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you could have your room. custom cabs of your arcade. Maybe in the future you could probably invite your friends and do two-player that might yeah. be interesting stand behind your friend and shout obscenities into the rear yeah so it's kind of bringing that uh co-op player experience back in the virtual world you know what it <laughs> needs though you need kind of like smell vision so you know the smell of like cigarettes and oh you cars. don't you don't see <laughs> the arcades especially at play uh, this weekend <laughs> yeah we ended up in one in blackpool didn't we yeah. um afterwards that, that was kind of fun but um yeah, you didn't, didn't, we won some random prizes at the arcade in Blackpool over the weekend, like a, a Pac-Man stress reliever. Yeah, right, you got an astronomy solar system kit. Have you so. built your kit yet? Uh, no, no. It's... <laughs> but it was actually cool. I mean, I'll tell you the funniest thing, though, when we're in that arcade over the weekend. I, I probably haven't been to an arcade like that since I was a kid. Yeah. Don't get the seats out much anymore. <laughs> and I was walking through, and there's a bit where all the fruit machines are and all that, and there's a little sign there going, you must be over 18 to enter this adults area. And I was like, well, I'm not allowed in there. <laughs> I was like, actually, yeah, I am. I'm in my 30s. Yeah, what the hell, yeah. <laughs> they need those signs in this game to be authentic. Ah, I, say, I find so. it is a bit weird, though, the arcade, because it was all on this kind of ticket system and winning yeah. prizes and stuff. And in in the corner, there was a few broken old house of the dead two machines and which stuff. Which you found and, straight you know, away, though, didn't which you? Which we went straight on, yeah. <laughs> Made a beeline for that. So, um, But yeah, this is kind of cool that you can recreate the arcade experience in your house. And if you've got something like an Oculus Rift and that as well, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, machines that may be, you know, hard to get hold of. It saves you building your own MAME cabinet, doesn't it? Oh, God, they're go. heavy, yeah. yeah <laughs> easier to move. Now, uh, obviously, we have got quite a bit of Sega news this week as well, since Tom Kalinske is going to be on. And uh, this is quite well-timed. Sega 3D Classics Collection has just been released for the um, Nintendo 3DS. Okay, so yes, we can obviously see the Sega Nintendo Wars over here. <laughs> oh yeah, long gone. <laughs> yeah, they're cross-releasing, but this looks good, man. Yeah, well it is, it's a collection. I mean, they've got, you know, some of Sega's most uh, famous games on here, stuff like Power Drift, um, the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, Altered um, Beast. Well, it's quite interesting, though, actually. Some people were saying, you know, why have you put the Mega Drive version of Altered Beast on, not the arcade version? But what they've done with these games is, um, you know, obviously the 3DS can give you a 3D effect without glasses or anything like that. But they said the original Alter BC arcade version didn't have parallax scrolling, so they couldn't make it into 3D. Nice. So that's why they had to put the Mega Drive one on. Well, it, it says here as well that they've got custom themes. Mm-hmm. So you can have, like, even going back to the SG-1000 early Sega machines, then you can go to the Saturn and Dreamcast and Game Gear, so... Well, one thing that you'll quite like, because I know you've uh, tried this system before, there is a couple of uh, Master System 3D games that they've ported to it. Oh, yeah, nice. Uh, Fantasy yeah. Zone 2 and Maze Walker. Now, you actually tried the original um, Sega Master System 3D glasses, didn't you? Oh, These God, they were awful. <laughs> Absolutely awful. If you want a seizure. <laughs> yeah, it was like running about, what, like six frames a second, wasn't yeah. it? Flickery screen, but... Um, yeah, if you want a slightly less headache-inducing way of playing those, they're on this well, that, collection Well, that's as well. cool, because it's a 3DS. Mm-hmm. So if you've got these 3D games, then you're going to get that 3D angle. Yeah, exactly. So uh, cool. quite a nice little bonus feature. And that's uh, just got released um, about a week ago, so it's out now. And I never thought I'd see the day when we um, saw an example of a high-definition VHS tape. Yeah, this is crazy. Now, I remember when I was a little kid, um, of these books in science and they'd all be about how televisions worked and CRTs Mm -hmm. and they had this thing in Japan which was called HDTV and it had like loads of lines on it and scan lines and everyone's like oh my god this is amazing but that was years ago and we never got anything they found this old VHS that was a, a, a kind of demo example of a HD VHS. And this is in 1993. 93, yeah. Yeah, so what's cool about it is, I mean, you look at this video and the, a few of the news websites have been running this as well. 
And uh, what this essentially was, um, HD VHS was, like you said, it was a prototype for, you know, these new kind of high definition displays they were working on at the time. Obviously, it never got released because DVD and all that came along, you know, by then they're already working on the DVD format. Yeah. But you look at this now and I know we've got cell phone cameras or mobile phone cameras that look better than this, but... Mm. It does look really clear. There's no like, you know, wow and flutter like you used to get on like VHS tapes and all that. And really, it looks like it could have been filmed today if it weren't for like, you know, the dodgy kind of early 90s. Yeah, if it wasn't hair. for the fashion sense. <laughs> <laughs> There's some proper shocking hairdos in this video, isn't there? Yeah. What's really cool as well, though, I mean, you look around it and they show you like Times Square. Oh, yeah, and they go into New York as well with all the old graffiti and stuff yeah. and uh, Brooklyn. and Well, even like the theatre is showing Paper Moon. That was out, you know, in 1993. And there's um, there's even uh, Camel Cigarettes, a massive billboard for those. And obviously you can't advertise yeah, cigarettes yeah. and billboards in America anymore. And uh, oh, the creepiest bit, though, is this guy that's um, walking under the World Trade Center and you see that in high definition. And, oh, yeah, uh, wow. Uh, and that was the same year it got bombed originally, wasn't it, 1993? So yeah. that must have been just before this recording. But it's just cool getting a glimpse into, you know, that era and seeing it in, um, you know, kind of like, like modern films look like in a way. It's a bit weird. Well, that's it. You know, it was the year that Jurassic Park was out. Yeah. And I remember the VHS quality of that. Uh, my friend had it. and yeah. yours, we... pro- yours probably wasn't an original, right? No. I mean, uh... I know how dodgy you are. <laughs> no, it wasn't original, but we'd watched it so many times and lent it to so many mates that that kind of footage was stretched out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, they didn't, didn't survive a lot of plays, no, did they, VHS? But if they'd released Jurassic Park with this, Jesus... Now, uh, Nolan Bushnell is back on it, as yeah. your headline says here. So he's back into games. Yeah, and he's, he's, he, recently he said, mobile phone games are lacking the fundamental kind of principles of arcade games and mm-hmm. the fun because they're doing these, you know, models of like pay to win or like kind of, oh, you own a few things and then if you spend some money, yeah. you can get a bit further or you have to wait two days. You know, it's not really... The arcade experience. Or spam all your mates on Facebook and we'll unlock another level. That's quite yeah, common, so, isn't it? so he says he's come up with 30 concepts mm-hmm. over the past decade and a half, and eight of those he'll be turning into mobile apps. Mm-hmm. They're going to be released well, as early as next year. Yeah, 2017, yeah. yeah so. Now it's a company called Spill Gaming. Um, Spill Games he's working with. So they're essentially just asking him to come up with ideas for games that he thinks will work well on modern platforms. Yeah, I guess just using him like a guru. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah. if anyone knows games, it's Nolan Bushnell, isn't it? Come exactly. on. Exactly. So. And it's not going to be Atari, is it, these days? Oh, exactly, yeah. Uh, they're just, what, suing people, aren't they, at the moment, as we, <laughs> as we heard last week? Now, uh, we have got quite a bit of Sega news this week to talk about, and uh, there are a couple of new movies coming out um, based around Sega, one of which we'll talk about in a moment, but this is actually based around a Sega franchise, this one. They're turning Shinobi into a film. I, I think they're <laughs> kind of pushing these... Uh, 16-bit consoles now and trying to get the legacy out there because everyone seems to have forgot. Well, this was, um, apparently it's a spin-off of um, one of Sega's companies called Stories International and the idea was, um, a couple of years ago, they said, right, you know, these old franchises we've got, why don't we try and turn these into, like, proper blockbuster movies, pretty much? And they banded around a few names by the looks of it here. So, uh, under consideration was uh, Streets of Rage. Oh, that would have been good. <laughs> Crazy Taxi. Oh. Can you imagine a movie about Crazy Taxi? It would just be the Offspring <laughs> theme tune yeah. constantly going. <laughs> so, I can't see how you'd make a full film out. Virtua Fighter? How are you going to make like a 90 no. minute movie? Well, they the managed it with more. I could combat, probably but... actually see Queen Latifah in Crazy Taxi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, driving, yeah, 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 yeah with Steve awesome. Martin. Like, no, <laughs> in the back. Uh, Altered Beast, Golden Axe was under consideration oh. too. You get a nice fancy film out of Golden Axe, I think, though. Yeah, you? Arnie would be good in Golden Axe. What is it as the warrior? Yeah, yeah. Like, like Warwick Davis is like the uh, what the little guys with yeah, sex. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but Shinobi is the first one that they're uh, planning on making into a movie. Now I think you know I used to love Shinobi in the arcades when I was a kid, and I don't think there's enough ninja movies around anymore. You don't really see a lot of them now, do you? Yeah, you really don't. There was a there was a ninja period in the nineties, wasn't there? Yeah, like, remember Three Little Ninjas? That was an awesome film. Oh, well, yeah, I, I, Surf I, Ninjas as well. It was everything ninja for a while, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> and I think over here in England as well, Beverly Hills Ninja. Over here in England, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was called yeah, Hero Turtles because ninja ninjas trade. were they were considered too uh, risque, I think, for kids at the time. But I think it's pretty cool that you know they might make a movie out of Shinobi. I mean. Let's be honest, there's kind of not a good track record of uh, video games getting turned into movies and coming out any, no, any good. No, but... especially, they've done the big names, haven't they? And, your Tomb uh, Raiders have been done. And, uh... Yeah, there was there was rumours of a Sonic one coming up, but yeah, you're totally right, like Mario Brothers <sighs> and uh, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat. Yeah, there's a big list. <laughs> <laughs> Normally all crap. Yeah, um, Doom. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, okay, this is kind of cool. It's a bit of novelty that you might, you know, you're going to get a, a movie about Shinobi. We'll all see it. Who used to play Shinobi in the old days. It'd be nice if the focus reference on like a proper... Proper updated game though. Yeah, yeah. Make, it a film, make but... the movie and then release a new. 
Yeah. Well, so, uh, yeah, we'll pop your link in the show notes at theretrohour.com if you want to find out more. Now, uh, we mentioned the Xbox 360 last week because um, it was the end of an era. Microsoft announced that it was being discontinued after a decade on sale. Yeah. Um, and they've been um, releasing a few kind of statistics about the 360 over the last week or so. And um, there's quite an interesting article here with uh, Robbie Back. Um, he's a former head of Xbox, and he revealed um, quite an interesting fact about how expensive this red ring of death is. Yeah, because he was. Was, he was a decision maker, wasn't he? So he'd be the guy that, shall we do this, and mm-hmm. then he'll be the guy that can control the money or know which departments are going to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. And they spent a billion pounds on fixing the red ring of death. So one mistake, this lack of cooling, which is essentially what ruined all these machines, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it says here, one mistake costs one billion dollars. And it was still worth it because the amount of consoles they still sold. You know, I think if they hadn't have got on that red ring of death thing Mm -hmm. and recalled machines and changed them, I think the Xbox 360's legacy would not be as Mm -hmm. strong as it is now. Well, absolutely. And it says here, you know, I remember, I mean, we've both had 360s that have had the red ring of death before. I'm on about my fourth one now. But actually, the one I've got now has lasted me since about 2009. So what was that trick that everyone used to do? Reballing it, where they basically take the processor off, put it in an oven, Mm -hmm. so all the solder melted, and then put it back on. (laughs) There's an even more ghetto solution, wrapping it up in a towel... Oh, yeah, and, and over the solar, it Yeah, completely. intentionally doing it. Then it'd work again for like a day or something. Um, but I do remember, though, because mine broke. I think it was just after, like, you know, the, the warranty had expired on it. Um, because I got, I got my, I didn't get my new, mine was a used one, actually. But yeah. it was, I think it had like six months' warranty left on it, and it broke then. But I remember Microsoft, I rang them up, you know, because I'd read online that apparently they will still repair them, even though you're out of warranty, because it's like a design defect. And uh, I think they extended it to three years in the end. You oh, know, wow. they, they fixed it three yeah. years after the warranty ran out. So that's a bit that cost them the one billion pounds, a promise to repair it, because, you know, they admitted, all right, it's our fault, we screwed up. But, I mean, like you said then, I think if they didn't, they'd have got such a bad reputation, wouldn't they? Yeah, because every machine, you know, they, you only had a certain range that were the Red Ring of Death ones. The original, every, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was like, um, it cost them a lot of money. But like you said, I mean, it, it left them with, uh, I think customers appreciated it after that. They kind of said, all right, Microsoft screwed up. But, you know, they put their hands up and like, we're going to make it right now. And uh, yeah. So it was a good thing and to do. And it was the best thing for them to do, definitely. Absolutely. Well, uh, they kind of to and fro in that generation, though, didn't they? I think eventually the PS3, I think, was a more popular one, but it took them a long time to overtake them. Yeah. It was only the last couple of years. I can't believe this next story as well. Now, Jerry Ellsworth, who I is... I love her. Oh, don't we all love Jerry now? <laughs> if, if anybody, even my girlfriend knows this, if I could ever run away with someone, it would be Jerry, <laughs> because she'd be able to build a C64. If you're stranded on a desert island, she's the person you'd want to be stuck with, yeah. yeah. She, she'd build you like a, a Sid chip out of a coconut or something. <laughs> so, uh, but Jerry, I mean, for those that are not familiar with the Commodore scene, um, she is, uh, you know, she, essentially she, she made the um, Commodore 64 in a joystick. Yeah, which um, sold on QVC, so one of the biggest kind of commercial things. And now she's working with Steam, mm-hmm. doing uh, AR casts. I think which is this kind of augmented reality tabletop Mm. gaming thing. We had Bill Hurd on the other week. She's worked with Bill before as well. And she's a a very, very talented um, engineer. She does a a series called Tech Girl and Fat Bloke. I haven't seen (laughs) that. The Fat Man and Tech Girl, yeah, that's it. What does it just show you how to make The Circuit Girl and the Fat Man, yeah. And they they broadcast live and it's basically, they'll have like little projects and they'll both discuss it and kind of build them on air and stuff. Yeah. It's quite cool. Well, she's, you know, she's, especially in the Commodore 64 scene, I mean, very well respected and, uh, you know, really talented as well. But it's, um, someone has nicked her Commodore 64 guitar. This is, yeah, she made a C64 guitar that yeah. looks like it actually works. It does, apparently, yeah. Well, there's actually a video of her on YouTube playing, like, you know, Sid stuff on it. So, so, so like... oh, God. And this actually has, like, you know, the head of the guitar and everything built in, and the, the bass bit is the uh, C64. Yeah, so you've got the guitar neck, and then the air uh, goes into a C64. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, you play the Sid chip with the guitar, by the looks of it. But, but like, who's, you know, who's going to have that? They can't pull it out in a few years if they're a C64 collector, or they can't sell it on eBay or anything, because it's so unique. There's only one it's in the world. It's one of a kind, yeah, yeah exactly. So, so apparently she was at a party and she brought it along to play some music, you know, gone for a couple of drinks, mingling and all that, come back and someone had walked off with it. But um, Well, there's going to be photos of them emerging online at some other party, like, check out my guitar. And you then, know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> geeks, geeks will track it down, hopefully. Yeah, you mess with the wrong person there, Mr. Yeah. Thief, whoever you are. So uh, keep an eye out for uh, <laughs> a Commodore 64 guitar appearing in any local pawn shops and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, if you oh, see yeah. it, we'll pass the news on to Jerry. Let's get it back for her. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, this, you know, how many Spectrum reboots do you need? Let's be honest. Although... 
There is a new one on the way. This is called the next Sinclair Spectrum. Okay, the next. What's the yeah. difference between this one and the other? Well, this one, um, it is a recreation of the Sinclair Spectrum, but in FPGA. Ah, okay. So, it, yeah. so it's like a modern take on the, um, the Spectrum Plus. It looks like Spectrum Plus design if you look at it. Uh, I know there's been a few of these going on recently, but this one is actually, they've got a license from uh, Sky, who quite interestingly owned the trope, because they bought Amstrad, didn't they? Who bought oh, Sinclair. That, that makes so much sense, actually, yeah. So Sky Television bought yeah. Amstrad to use the technology for the set-top boxes, but with Amstrad, they got a bonus of Sinclair packages. Yeah, exactly. So oh. I think maybe they've just realised this recently, so now they've officially licensed it. Uh, Sky In-Home Service Limited have um, given them the permission to manufacture hey, maybe, these. Uh, maybe maybe if they start seeing some money coming through this or something, they may uh, do some Sky Television Spectrum channels where you could play the old specky games on awesome. it. Or yeah, on the, on on the, the Sky box. box yeah. <laughs> well, this is really cool. I mean, it's, you know, like, like a lot of these kind of recent ones have, it's got, you know, stuff like um, uh, RGB Mini HDMI on there as well. It uses an SD card mm. yeah, instead of you know loading off tapes and uh, it's got like you know db9 compatible joystick interface on there you can use a ps2 mouse and um it's really you know it's for the spectrum fans again uh, you can even get a white one though which is really cool what it's what a period to be a spectrum fan it, just, <laughs> it must be going mad <laughs> exactly it's like you know you're not short of options if you need a new machine are you yeah. let's be honest now you spotted this story um yesterday which i thought was quite interesting yeah, I, I thought it might have been a screenshot or a small video or something. So this is essentially, a guy has managed to get Windows 95 running on an Apple Watch. <laughs> now, you showed me this, and we're in the hotel in Blackpool, weren't we? Uh, I had a slightly sore head, I think. And yeah. we were about to go for breakfast. I looked at it, I was like, oh, it's fake, someone's just running a video. <laughs> uh, but it turns out it's not. So what this guy's done, um, it's a chap called Nick Lee, and uh, he posted this video on YouTube. Yeah. And apparently he's used, he's kind of used some of the um, development tools for the Apple Watch, swapped out a few of the components and actually put like an X86 emulator in there as well <laughs> and kind of run it virtually. Because it's ARM-based, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, the, obviously the, the Apple Watch is ARM, but um, Windows 95 only runs on Intel. So he's actually managed to get it boot up. And, you know, you look at the specs of the Apple Watch here, it runs a 520 megahertz CPU. It's got half a gig of RAM, eight gigabytes of storage, and you think, you know, that would have been like a supercomputer back when Windows 95 came out, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could run Duke Nukem really well on that. <laughs> well, I mean, he's shown you here. I mean, you can actually use a touchscreen on the Apple Watch to open the start menu and all that. Obviously, being like, you know, a 48 millimeter screen, it's not going to be like, a, you know, the best user experience using it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And apparently it takes an hour to boot. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's doing quite a lot of stuff under the hood. But it's, I think, you know... Apple products are generally known for being quite locked down, aren't they? And you can't... Yeah, that's the whole thing about Apple, isn't it? The closed environment. And, the walled garden. Uh, yeah, and Windows is the big open environment, but that leads to malware. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? But I think, you know, there are obviously you, there are ways around this if you know how to do it, and this guy proves, you know, nothing's impossible. Yep. Now, before we chat to the legendary Tom Kalinske, um, we're going to ask him about this in a moment as well. Uh, but The Console Wars, which was a book, wasn't it? Um, mm, a couple yeah. of years ago. Um, Blake Harris did the book, and... There was talk about this, uh, and it's going to happen very soon, and they turn this into a, a proper blockbuster movie. Now, this is a proper movie. We talk about movies on the Retro Hour. Yeah, indie and, stuff a lot of the time. And a lot of the time, they're documentaries, and they're kind of aimed at nerds. But this is Seth Rogen, and mm -hmm. this is going to be out there, you know, as, as like Steve Jobs' movie, or something on that level, mm -hmm. you know, because this story hasn't really been told to the new generation of the fierce console wars that happened before the Wii and before all these items. Well, this is essentially the story of the, you know, the really brutal, bitter battle that happened back in the early 90s and late 80s. Um, Nintendo versus Sega, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of people hold fond memories of that era, but they're not necessarily interested enough anymore to kind of look into exactly what happened and the people behind it and all that kind of thing. Mm. So um, it'd be nice to get the story out there as well. I know that Tom Kalinske, who we're going to talk to in a moment, was um, quite, you know, involved with the um, the book when it came out. He actually spoke to Blake and, you know, shared a lot of his stories. And he said when he read the book he actually didn't realise quite a lot of it from Nintendo's side. Ah, so, um, that's good. And for me, these guys defined cool. Yeah, absolutely. That was it, you know, it was a cool-off, wasn't it? Who was mm. the coolest? Yeah. And by doing that, they just changed the whole gaming scene into this kind of adulty PlayStation cool, edgy place. Well, I'm know? just looking forward to seeing, like, um, the recreations of the, you know, the sets of probably, like... 
Sega you know, HQ. And yeah, stuff. Sega yeah. HQ, and like you know, the old systems will be there, and they'll be like you know, doing like I imagine scenes of developing the games and all that. So it's going to be cool, isn't it? Just oh, seeing all that stuff. So, um, I'm very interested to hear Tom Kalinsky's thoughts. So we're going to have to ask him next. Yeah, there'll be a whole surge of interest in Sega and Nintendo again. Absolutely. Well, we are going to chat to Tom Kalinsky now. Now, we'll just say before um, we played this interview, we did have a few issues with Skype. Um, as it yeah, was a- it was a bit glitchy for about five minutes at the beginning, but then it does pick up. Yeah, so yeah. do you give it a bit of time. You just swap to a headset and we do uh, call him back about two or three times. But yeah. I It's think hard with these uh, transatlantic connections, isn't it? It is, yeah. and I think it's, you know, but a guy like Tom Kalinsky, it's worth, you know, maybe putting up with not amazing HD audio quality to of these stories he's got coming up. Yeah. in the next half an hour so uh, yeah do bear with it it does improve after about five minutes for the next half an hour here he is former CEO of Sega Tom Kalinsky on the Retro Hour and we'll catch you again next Friday Sega Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast Tom it's amazing to have you on now um we're going to be talking about video games in a moment, but I think everybody of our generation, I mean, your your resume kind of reads like a, you know, a documentation of my childhood, if you like. So I've got to ask <laughs> you about He-Man, first of all. How did the character in the TV show of He-Man come around? Because I know you were heavily involved in that, weren't you, when you worked for Mattel? Oh, yeah. It was it was kind of interesting. The, He-Man was one of the most, I think, well-researched uh, developments that we ever did at Mattel. Because you have to understand, we we didn't have a male action figure line, and, and uh, Hasbro had... Star Wars and G.I. Joe, and, and we didn't have much of anything. We had something called Big Jim for a while, but that didn't work out too well. Mm-hmm. And so I started researching all different themes that would be appealing. I literally, we researched everything you could imagine, from policemen to firemen to Marvel characters to DC characters to whatever else was on television at the time. Several things that we just kind of made up, and He-Man was obviously one of those, a, a heroic NSC figure, very muscular. You know, he looks like me. You can probably tell yeah. that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, it, it, as part of that concept, an adversary, and that was Skeletor. And so it was frankly surprising to most of us this fantasy character did so well in the research, and then we went ahead and developed the Toy line first. The toy line came first. Okay. We developed He Man and his, on Iron Man and his friends, and then uh, and Skeletor and his. Of course, we had the play, the big playset, Castle Grayskull, and other playsets. And the line did very, very well. Back first year, we did something like seventy-five million dollars in sales, which in those years was very, very good. The chairman of the board, a guy named Art Spear, came into my office one day and he said, "Well, yeah, it's nice to develop this toy line for boys, but." It'll never amount to much because you don't have a TV show or a movie and you can't get one. And that kind of annoyed me. And I said, you want to bet? <laughs> so uh, I started working with uh, Eddie Smart and got to know Lou Scheimer, who ran Filmation Studios. And they really took this project on. How do we get a television show? It's going to be very expensive. About $7.5 million to do an animated 65 episode so it could run know, uh, for 13 weeks, five days a week after school. Uh, the show was so popular, we actually we actually made money off of selling the advertising on the on the television show. So it was quite a quite a successful uh, endeavor. I think I probably talked enough about that. Now you <laughs> well, want something else? I don't. I don't remember a household without He-Man figures somewhere. Yeah, when I was a kid, had them. You know? and to be fair, it was quite a scary show as a kid. But looking back, you know, Skeletor and Castle Grayskull, they were quite, you know, for, for young kids, it was actually quite um, cutting edge, really, wasn't it? Well, it, it was edgy. But remember, at the end, and one of the things that uh, Joe Morrison and John Weems did was they made sure that there was a moral message throughout the show of Skeletor and his his guys were stealing stuff or something. You know, the moral message at the end might be. Now, kids, you can see that stealing is bad, and you yeah. shouldn't do that. You know, <laughs> so there was always some good message at the end of the, of each episode. So, um, what was your first computer experience? Ah, uh, gosh, no one's ever asked me that before. We had a children's computer called the TLC, and for the life of me now, I can't remember what. It, oh, the, I think it was the, T, the child, the learning computer, the ch, the learning computer, clever mm-hmm. name. Yeah. <laughs> And it was a very rudimentary first effort at doing a computer for young kids. You know, it wasn't in color. It was uh, an LCD screen with a keyboard. You could do very, very little with it. And it cost still a hundred and something dollars and it was not successful. So that was my that was my first computer experience with. Of course, we were using big computers in the in the company for doing lots of 
processing of, of things. But it was my first real consumer computer. And then after that, we did the handheld games, which are what would be considered a racing game and uh, uh, the Amer- an American football game only. You only had five players on each side. And we marketed those to fathers for Father's Day, and they were very successful. And that was the start of what became Intellivision. Mm. And the Intellivision was developed, obviously, by Mattel with Atari and for a while it was it was successful and then both Atari and Intellivision obviously took a big nosedive. So um, after Mattel then, how did you get to Sega? I left Mattel, resurrect uh, a company in your neck of the woods called Matchbox and a guy named uh, David Ye who was a friend of mine who did a lot of contract manufacturing. He ran a lot of big manufacturing operations out of Hong Kong and Macau, and he was quite successful, and we became friends. So we decided to go after uh, Matchbox. Matchbox was in receivership in the UK, and you know how that works. I mean, you have to to get something out of receivership. You not only have to work with the creditors, but and the banks, but also with the unions. And uh, so we we managed to uh, try to revive Matchbox. The deal was we kept a factory open in uh, to where they make the uh, Enfield. Okay. Yeah. The rifles, <laughs> Enfield. And uh, we had to obviously move a lot of operations to plants in Hong Kong and Macau in order to boss and be competitive to the pricing of Hot Wheels and other brands. So we did that, and we and we basically restructured. Matchbox was mostly a U.K., European, and Australian company, more so than it was a U.S. company. And so uh, we had to travel around to Germany and France and Italy in Spain and and uh, resurrect the businesses in each market. And so we traveled, he and I traveled, I traveled more than he did, but I traveled about 200 days a year. And we got it done and we took it public and we were kind of successful with it and we were exhausted and somebody made an offer to buy it. And so uh, right after we had completed those negotiations were reaching where we could see it was completed. I family on a vacation to Hawaii, and uh, the chairman of Sega kind of tracked me down there, and uh, I had known him. It wasn't like he was a stalker or something. <laughs> I'd known him from business, both when I was at Mattel and at Matchbox. You got to come to Japan with me and see what 16-bit technology is all about, and eventually went, and I was very, very impressed by 16-bit. And you can imagine my experience before that had been television, which we could consider maybe two-bit technology. So I sort of missed the 8-bit, uh, what it looked like, and I, I got familiar with it, obviously, what Master System looked like and NES looked like. But 16-bit to me was just eye-opening. I thought it was astonishing at the time. I know that sounds crazy today. It was really different, and I fell in love with it. Well, obviously, you know, around that time, Nintendo were kind of uh, had a bit of a monopoly on gaming, particularly in, in the U.S., how did you go about taking them on? You're absolutely right. I mean, they had, and this is, people told me not to take this position because Nintendo had 98% of the market. And, uh, you know, they could, they controlled all the third-party publishers. If you dared publish on a different system, Nintendo would somehow punish you. If you were a retailer and you dared to bring in a Sega product uh, uh, or NEC product, you would get shipments of NES cut back and you wouldn't get the quantities that you wanted or thought you could sell through to consumers. So they had tremendous market power. You know, looking at that, I, I, my strategy was we got to be very different. Uh, we're going to leave them the children's market, the young boys, girls market, and we're going to go after teens and college age uh, students primarily. And we're going to position Nintendo as the little kids platform. Knowing full well that if the teenage boy wants to play on Sega and he has a younger brother at home, he's going to want to play on Sega too. So that was all part of the the original thinking. Then, of course, the bigger parts were we were going to go after sports games, American football, baseball, FIFA soccer, and, and most importantly, we were going to, you know, one character that we all loved was Sonic the Hedgehog. We changed it dramatically from what was originally as the uh, Japanese uh, development team had had originally presented it and we were going to lower the price of our hardware steam genesis mega drive in your in your country from uh, 199 dollars to 149 dollars and uh, be very aggressive in going after after nintendo amazingly all that worked <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a uh, very strange at the time entering the european market as well because it was so fragmented with consoles and computers and and obviously uh, computer games were, were more important uh in in Europe than they were even in the United States. 
So, you know, it was a different, little bit of a different uh, approach. But I think the thing that uh, I, I was struck by most is, you know, we were very aggressive in our getting and advertising in the U.S. In the U.K., I think they were even uh, more aggressive and cleverer in their advertising than, than we will, were. I mean, there were some outstanding commercials that were done in the U.K., I remember as well you had the uh, the Sega Scream campaign, which was, um, you know, kind of, again, that appealed more to that cooler kind of late teens generation, really. Um, h- how did that come about then, that campaign? So um, we had been doing the Sega Does What Nintendo Don't campaign prior. We did a, we had a number of agencies uh, at our account. Wyden and Kennedy, which had the Nike business, was one of them. I, and uh, Boozell Jacobs was a current agency, did, a, did another pitch and, and uh, uh, several others. Goodby was just this dynamo. I mean, he was, and he was so aggressive. He came up with a Sega scream. I mean, it all kind of, we all jumped up, you know, and took notice at, at that. And then, of course, the welcome to the next level in, in text streaming across the, the screen was very clever to position us as the next level. I've noticed many other companies use that line now, welcome to the next level. Um, and then again, the, the, the humor that he brought advertising. I mean, one of my favorite commercials here in the U.S. was where we, where we positioned the Nintendo NES as, uh, as a slow old uh, smoky milk truck, the uh, Genesis as a Ferrari, you know, and yeah. just very clever advertising that went along with a lot of the other activities that my marketing team was doing. I bet you were getting lots of uh, lawsuits from Nintendo at that time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we really got under their skin, which of course I enjoyed tremendously. I don't know if you remember the Game Gear commercial. So Game Gear, of course, was handheld, LCD, mm. color screen, as opposed to Game Boy, black and white or green and, and white screen. So we positioned uh, them as, as like a, you know, dogs are colorblind. We had a line in there about, well, if you, if you can't tell the difference, uh, you're like a dog that wants to drink out of a toilet. <laughs> this just drove Nintendo crazy. They immediately sent a cease and desist order, uh, and we ran the commercial a few more times, uh, you know, and, and then off the air, but it already had its impact on the market. All right, I'm, I actually found a little uh, earbuds and microphone. Yeah, so that maybe, sounds a lot better than it did. Maybe this will be somewhat of an improvement. You mentioned the European market then, too, and how different it was. I mean, one thing that really, you know, we noticed was um, it was called the Genesis in America and the Mega Drive here in the UK. Um, did that cause problems with marketing then? And what was kind of the story behind that? Yeah, of course, it would, it would have been much better had we been able to have the, the same name around the world for the product. But unfortunately, the name Mega Drive was taken in the United States and was owned by, I can't remember who now, but anyway, they weren't going to let us use it. So we had to come up with a different name for, uh, for the U.S., and, and it worked out okay. I mean, Genesis, of course, has a couple different meanings. And, uh, you know, it has a biblical meaning, and it has a rebirth kind of meaning. So that worked out, I think, very well for us. But, of course, it would have been better had we been able to have one name around the world. Well, it, it was very interesting in the U.K. as well because we, we kind of got everything a bit later on uh, with Sega. A lot of the places adopted... 8-bit machines like America and we were very like slow with the master system and stuff um, was it kind of strange having Commodore and Atari around at those times and were you particularly paying attention to them well n- not so much frankly because Atari was really pretty much gone by then in the United States and, and Commodore uh, wasn't much of a factor here uh, even though it used as I recall I think the same basic chipset that was in a Mega Drive. So Atari we didn't really worry about and then of course Atari morphed into uh, Tengen here in the US and they became a partner and and a third a very important third party publisher for us on the on the Genesis. Well, we did mention Commodore there, and the Amiga was quite a big platform here in Britain. I do remember at the time um, they brought out a CD platform, and they they had quite an aggressive um, marketing campaign against Sega. I think they even put like a billboard outside the your HQ. London HQ. Yeah. Um, do you remember any of that? Or did you notice any of it at the time? I, I you know what, I vaguely remember it, but it, it I don't think it was it, it didn't uh, it didn't bother us a lot. I don't believe in our our quest to build the Sega business in uh, in the UK. Now, obviously, you mentioned before that the uh, the Game Boy was a big uh, a big deal in America, but you came along with um, I, you know, we've all we'd all agree, I think, a superior platform with the Game Gear. Um, was it a direct response to the Game Boy? Oh, absolutely. 
And the, and the fact that it's such an obvious thing that boys and girls would want to have portable uh, uh, gaming, and as certainly they do today mm-hmm. on tablets and iPhones and uh, other smartphones. So, yes, I mean, I, I think mobile was a, an area that we were very interested in. The one thing that always irked me was we were never able to really solve the battery life issue with, uh, with Game Boy. I think it would have been so much better had we had a much longer... Uh, yeah, it, it did kind of eat through those uh, AA batteries, didn't it? Yeah. Yes, it did. Uh, never were able to solve that. But as I said, you know, you're driving a color LCD screen and it used a lot of juice, unfortunately. Well, the, one of the really popular Game Gear things here in the UK was the TV add-on. And, uh, it the- was. I, is that right? I didn't realize that because it, we never were, it was never that popular in the, uh, in the U.S. I mean, I, I liked it. Uh, we didn't sell that many of them. Yeah, maybe, I don't know if people had cable there or something, but um, <laughs> quite a lot of Game Gear users would use them in the UK regularly, often in school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about the uh, the Mega Drive. Um, obviously, after the Mega Drive had been out for a couple of years, we saw the introduction of the, uh, the Sega CD and the 32X. Um, what was kind of the thinking behind those from your perspective? Well, the the Sega two different thoughts. The Sega CD, we we knew that the world eventually was to go to CD and or the, you know the next it, optical disc technology. In any case, and we knew we had to learn how to program for it. So it was really it was a couple of things. First of all, it was we had to experiment and learn how to do this, and then there was this big promise that we all bought into, which was this idea of. Uh, we're going to be able to combine full motion picture with great 3D animation, with uh, symphonic music, uh, rock and roll music, with real actors. And you put all that together and it's going to end up with a better gaming experience than what we have with, with just doing uh, uh, animation. And, and uh, you know, it sounds great. Uh, not so easy to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least not in those days, but it was a, certainly a worthwhile uh, effort. In my in my opinion, it was a worthwhile effort. It was something that we, ha- as a company, had to do and had to learn from. Thirty two X is a bit different. the The promise there was we were we were it was going to help us extend the life of the sixteen bit Genesis. I wasn't completely on board on this. Uh, I thought we had a we should have kept going with the Genesis for another year. Uh, as, as it was, but there, we were under a lot of pressure from Japan that we had to do something to to have 32-bit technology. Anyway, the promise, the the effort was they were supposed to have six games, I think, from the U.S. and six from Japan at time of launch. And I think we ended up with three. It wasn't enough. Uh, they, w- they weren't different enough. There was one or two really good ones. I think Doom was pretty good. But it wasn't highly successful, obviously. Do you think that was uh, also due to not having a Sonic game released with it? Oh, sure, that sure. That would have helped tremendously had we, had we been able to do that. But uh, clearly you can't, uh, can't rewrite history. Were you disappointed with the Sega CD sales? Uh, not so much. No, I, I, really, I really wasn't. Because, I, I, again, it was more of a, a step that we had to take in order to get to the future. And everybody was in the learning experience on it. And if we hadn't done that, I think it would have taken the company a lot longer to figure out how to program on uh, optical disc media. Yeah, every company was out there, weren't they? Panasonic. And that was, oh, yeah. You know. yeah. Everybody was trying. Nintendo never did it, though. <laughs> Not till much later. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned then, I mean, uh, the 32X and, um, you know, obviously... Sega of Japan as well. I mean, did you find that you had many fights on your hand with um, with Sega of Japan? Was it kind of a, a difficult relationship a lot of the time? Well, initially it wasn't. Initially, uh, I mean, I think uh, in the book Console Wars they depict it pretty well. Where when I when I went over to after really only being in the job for three or four months, I went over to Japan and said, "Listen, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to lower the price. We're going to do a lot of development in the U.S. We're going to take on Nintendo. We're going to make fun of them. We're going to go after college and teens." Uh, we're going to do tons of sports titles. Uh, they all thought I would. Oh, and by the way, we're going to put Sonic the Hedgehog in the hardware, which, of course, eliminates a very profitable software sale. And when you include it in the hardware, you obviously don't make much money. So in many cases, you're losing money. So they all thought I was nuts and didn't want to do it. But Nakayama, the chairman, had, had turned as he was leaving the room and said, hey, when I hired you, I said you could make the decisions for the, for the Western world. And 
go ahead and do what you said. And so when, when we were very successful the first couple of years, the relationship was quite good. But what I didn't realize was going on back in, uh, in Japan, they never, as you probably are aware, Sega Japan never uh, was that successful in the consumer market. They never got above a 10% share, whereas we had gotten to uh, over a 50% share by 93 in the United States. And what I didn't realize was Nakayama would walk into the Monday morning management meetings and just beat the hell out of the marketing and product development team in Japan. And, you know, if somebody's beating on you all the time and saying, why aren't you as successful as those guys in the U.S. and U.K.? Pretty soon you, you get to hate those guys in the U.S. and the U.K. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I think that's what happened. Uh, and that we got a lot less cooperation and, and uh, things stopped going as smoothly by 94 uh, and uh, you know it was a, it was a struggle you know we were we, it was a fight for anything after that point uh, in terms of cooperation from uh, from Japan and I wasn't aware until literally after I left the company at what was going on in Japan I didn't realize that this feeling of uh, animosity had developed one thing that I read was when they were developing the Saturn you were kind of looking to partner with Silicon Graphics and uh, that kind of I, fell through. Yeah, they didn't like that either. Um, uh, Jim Clark, who was then chairman of Silicon Graphics, and I had gotten to know each other a little bit, and he called me up and, and actually the guy working for him, uh, Jensen Wayne, is the founder of 3DX, was working at Silicon Graphics at that time, and he had developed this chipset, which looked like it was pretty good, you know, for, for a video game console. And my head of R&D was a guy named Joe Miller, a very, very smart guy. And when he was looking at the specs for the Saturn, he, he just basically said to me, I, I kind of worry about this. I don't know if it's good enough. And so he and I went over and met with, uh, with the Silicon Graphics guys and saw what they could do and thought it was pretty impressive and invited uh, the Japan team, the hardware team, to come over and look at this chipset. And they did. And, of course, they said, Oh no, it's not as good as what we have. <laughs> and their, their excuse was that uh, the chip was too big, there'd be too much throw off in manufacturing and uh, it would drive the costs up. And so we, we didn't do it. And uh, so Jim called me and said, well, what do I do now? And I said, well, there's this company up in Seattle you can go talk to. And he did and made a deal up there. So that's another example of how the relationship between the U.S. and Japan was not as good as it as it could have been or should have been uh and in my opinion uh uh you know i i think we were right i think they were wrong what did you think of the saturn then when you when you saw it well again uh i'm not a i'm not a technical person but i was looking for uh bigger differences between between 16-bit and and what we had in saturn and I was also looking for more uh, internet connectivity and ability to do uh, multiplayer social games. And so I, I was a bit disappointed in it. And uh, by that point in time, frankly, I, I also I didn't want to have to introduce it uh, originally in the fall. And then Nakayama said, well, you're not introducing it in the fall. You're introducing it at, at E3 in June. And you're going to have to limit the introduction to a few retailers because we can't make enough of them to supply all retail distribution in the U.S. Oh, and then, by the way, we only have three games done. So I, I, was not, uh, I was not happy about this. And at that point, I pretty much, you know, I went along with it, but I started looking at other, other things to do. Because I read that one of the launch titles was going to be a uh, Sonic Extreme. Uh, that's right, and then there were others too. I mean, I don't remember now, but there were there were others that that fell through, and uh, you just can't or shouldn't introduce a platform when you only have three games available for it. Well, obviously, it surprised a lot of developers as well. I mean, what was kind of the feedback coming coming towards you from developers when you kind of announced it onto the market way before they expected? Well, they, everybody was angry. Uh, the developers were angry about it because they felt they, you know, stabbed in the back a bit because they weren't obviously weren't weren't ready, couldn't have been ready. And then on top of that, much worse of a problem for me was the retailers were really furious. I mean, the people who I had grown up in the industry with, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't supply them with hardware or software. You know, th th this was really bad in terms of relationships and feelings towards Sega and a desire by these retailers to punish Sega and get behind uh, Nintendo and Sony, uh, you know, and, and do everything they could to, to frankly hurt Sega at that time. 
So th- these are things that I, I don't think the management team in Japan really understood well enough, uh, didn't understand the, the ramifications of the actions that they were, they were taking. But clearly it, it really hurt the company. That must have been, after the success you had with the Genesis, that must have been pretty heartbreaking. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely was. And, and also, I really was personally friendly with a lot of these people. So I had strong personal relationships with senior management at a lot of these uh, retail establishments. So, so personally, it was pretty devastating as well. How soon did you know that the Saturn wasn't going to be the success that you hoped it would be? Oh, I think right from the beginning. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it took us too long to figure that out. But, you know, we kept up a uh, stiff upper lip, as you would say, and uh, forged on. And then by the end of that year, I was pretty much, uh, uh, had made up my mind I was going to have to leave the, leave the company. So when you were at Sega, I mean, in, in the glory days as well, what was the atmosphere like there? What was it like to work there? Oh, it was a great place. Absolutely great place. I mean, we had so much fun. I mean, we were, uh, we celebrated our, our successes and we celebrated good failures. You know, we had a number of those. And, and, and so, you know, we just, uh, it was a very collegial atmosphere, very exciting. We worked very hard. People were working late into the evening. I mean, in in Redwood City, we were very close to Oracle. We used to go over and eat in their, their lunchroom, which was attractive to us because it was basically very low cost or free. Mm-hmm. And, and we had like a, we, we had programmers and, and people working in product development that, that basically spent the night in the office. I mean, they had bunk beds in there and uh, we were the largest consumer of pizza and Coca-Cola, I think, on the <laughs> peninsula here. Uh, it was just a, it was a lot of fun. And we, you know, on Fridays we had uh, beer parties outside and barbecues. And when some, somebody did a great, uh, had a great idea, but it failed, I would give them the rubber chicken award for, for taking a good risk that was worthwhile doing. So in a lot, a lot of different things we did that were fun. Some of the games that I really liked were Aladdin and Lion King. And uh, I think they're some of the best, like, tie-in film games it, how was it developing those with Disney? Oh yeah, that was that was really fun. I mean, Aladdin. There, <laughs> I think one of the stories that I I think it was recorded in the Council Wars book. But developing that with obviously uh, Disney and and Jeff Katzenberg was very involved. The guy who's now running uh, DreamWorks, and uh, at, at that particular uh, E3 or C, CES, I forgot which. Now we were going to show the game off it was going to be introduced and we had i think richard branson was coming in from virgin uh, because he had virgin games in the uk and we had katzenberg coming in and the team that was developing the game had it on an eprom and the only eprom that worked properly with the latest version was in the hands of one of the female product managers and she fell asleep after being <laughs> up all night she fell asleep like four in the morning and and wasn't there at the show, so we had nothing to show them. So we're I'm walking through the show with Katzenberg, and I kept stopping at different booths along the way and say, "Oh, look at this! Isn't that interesting? What this? <laughs> look what this third party is doing!" Or, "How about that package? What do you think of that, Jeff?" I, mean, I was just stalling for time, and I had a, a uh, an earpiece in where we were communicating with each other and. Finally, they said, we found her. We woke her up. We've got the, we've got the EEPROM. You can take him to the Sega booth now. And he never knew any of this was going on. So then we took him there and we showed him the Aladdin game. And of course, it was really good and he loved it. And- History was made of I mean, it is a great movie tie-in. And I don't think until those games, I didn't see a movie tie-in that was as polished and actually a fun game. Because before that, you'd see a lot of movie tie-in games. But generally, they were pretty poor games because they spent all the money on the license. Or they'd have nothing to do with the movie. Yeah, you know. exactly. You mean like Atari's E.T.? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a, a prime example. Yeah, famous example, that one, isn't it? <laughs> a kind of lot of, lot of the games were um, series. So, you know, you'd have Streets of Rage and you'd get the Streets of Rage 2, 3 and just taking these uh, known formats and expanding on them. Making them into franchises. Yeah. Yes, uh, very much so. And, and of course, uh, I mean, I thought we did a pretty good job with Sonic while, while we were there. Uh, having looked at some of the Sonic games afterward, I, I think they've, they've kind of stubbed their toes a few times. And, and that, that is a great brand and, and, and still should be a great brand in, in the, the business. And I think it is still a great brand. It's amazing how strong uh, brands how long they will last as long as uh, every now and then you have a great product. But I think they had too many that weren't so great. And uh, hopefully the next ones that come out will be great again. 
Yeah, I read uh, Sonic was more recognisable than Mickey Mouse or Bill Clinton at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we had higher Q, higher Q scores than any of the Disney characters for a while. Did you play many of the games? Were you much of a player? Yeah, I wasn't a very good player, you know, I, I, but I did. I, I, my favorite was Sonic 2, and I would play the sports games uh, with my kids. Uh, and I'd play the racing games largely. Uh, I still have a... In my in my basement here, I had still <laughs> you'll laugh. I still have a 16-bit setup. Nice. And I still do Virtua Fighter every now and then. And, Excellent. Uh, you know, so yeah. I, but I wasn't as good a game player as a lot of the people inside Sega. I mean, Joe Miller was a fantastic game player. But to your kids, though, you must have been like the coolest guy in the world, like you know, running Sega, bringing home games every day. <laughs> well, as as I I really liked it when I would go pick my daughters up at uh, school and somebody would yell out Sega. <laughs> <laughs> So that was pretty cool. Well, you mentioned the uh, the Console Wars book. Um, Blake Harris actually, you know, spoke to you extensively while making that book. What did you think um, after you read it then? Did you learn any, like, new bits from it? I mean, I knew most of the parts about Inside Sega of America, but I had no idea of what was going on in Nintendo and how they were feeling. I mean, I had some idea. I knew they didn't like us. But uh, he really found out lots of things that I was unaware of uh, that they were doing there to try to to thwart us and so that was that was eye-opening to me and then of course he's the one who found out about how the, the folks in japan were feeling about our success and why why it actually kind of worked against us so a lot of that stuff i learned from the book i didn't know it before him and now they're making it into a movie which is pretty yeah crazy, well we, isn't it? we we we're kind of in a in a strange position right now the documentary has largely been shot uh but the producer scott Rood and, and Seth Rogen have to agree on some editing changes and music and that kind of thing. And apparently they haven't been able to get together. And the same thing for the feature film. Uh, Seth is responsible for writing the script. He has the rights to it. And he, he renewed those rights through January of uh, next year, 2017. But if he doesn't get it done by then, our, our, our feeling is that... Uh, that maybe somebody else will end up writing the, the script. Because obviously the big book has to go down to about a 200, 220-page uh, mm. feature film script. You can't do a whole 16 pages in a movie. Is it pretty crazy for you, though, that this stuff you're doing 20 years ago is now the subject of Hollywood movies? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very bizarre for, for me. Uh, and I'm, I'm frankly still somewhat taken aback by how much interest there is in that period of time in gaming that went on in that period of time. I mean, I just, it just never occurred to me that there were that many people interested in it. But clearly there are. So uh, do you know who's going to be playing you in it? I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. My, my daughters think it should be Bradley Cooper. Yeah, <laughs> not, not a bad choice. <laughs> so in your final days at Sega then, when did you make the decision to leave? Well, I pretty much, during the, the, the Saturn uh, debacle, I pretty much had made up my mind to leave then. And, and, I, and by the way, I was somewhat open with uh, Nakayama about that, uh, you know, that I wasn't happy about that. And, uh, and so I started looking around at that, at that point, point in time. Did you keep an eye on Sega much after you left, like how they were doing? Well, a little bit. But, you know, the strange thing that happens is you get so tied up in your new business that I wasn't able to stay in touch for, for quite a while. And you just get so busy doing that, I really didn't have time to, to, to pay much attention to the video game industry other than watching my boys play, play video games. So I would say I, I really lost track of it till about 2005. And then I, uh, uh, when we decided to, to divide the assets back to, of the 36 companies back to Mr. Ellison and Milken, I started paying attention to it again. So I, I had a long period of time there where I wasn't paying attention. Were you sad when Sega got out of the hardware market? Yeah, yeah, I was. Uh, you know, I, I think they, again, they, they stubbed their toe. Uh, but I was sad because I thought that uh, they, first of all, they had opened the door and proven that Nintendo, that you could have more than one uh, one hardware manufacturer in the marketplace uh, opened the door for for Sony to come in and for Microsoft to come in, and so I, I had I had hoped they would stay in the in the hardware development business, but 
clearly financially it's a it's a burden and you have to be very large and very successful in order to afford new hardware R&D and the inventory carrying costs of of hardware and the and the low profitability of hardware and and have to have a plan where you make all your profit on the software that you sell. So I understand their their rationale for it, but I am sorry that they got out. Did you ever think you'd see the day when uh, Sega games were coming out Nintendo hardware though? <laughs> never, never. Yeah. Boy was I shocked by that. I mean, I was really floored. And I, you know, I got invited back to, I, I guess I got invited every year. I was one of the founders of E3, so they always invite me. And, I, and for years, I didn't go. But I, when I, I went and saw Sonic and Mario a few years ago in uh, racing, that really shocked me. And I got to play it. I played it against the, uh, the demonstrator, and fortunately, I beat him. Uh, of course, <laughs> I was Sonic, and he was Mario. So I enjoyed that. But yeah, it's shocking to me. Well, Tom, what, what are you up to these days? And you're involved in uh, Leapfrog? Uh, I had been for many, many years. I was CEO of Leapfrog, and, and we just arranged for the sale of Leapfrog to VTech. Um, I'm still involved with something called Cambium Learning Group, which is using technology to improve uh, education for young children primarily. And the one, I'm back in the game business. I just accepted the role as chairman of Gazillion Games, where they have the Marvel license. Oh, wow. And so, and so I've just started that role. And so I've now got to pay attention to the whole video game market again and get up to speed on w- what Steam is doing and, and, of course, what the large, uh, uh, large companies, the large hardware manufacturers are doing. And, of course, EA and Activision and what have you. So I'm, I'm kind of ba- I'm getting back into the business again at... Uh, the ripe old age of 72. <laughs> and I guess that's an entirely new model, the free-to-play online game model. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's very different for me. And obviously you have to have lots of new stuff every week uh, for people to spend a few pennies on in order to build a business. Must be exciting though being back into it. It is. And I, you know, I've always liked the people that are involved in the video game business. I, I always thought that some of the best programmers in the world worked on, on video games. You know, they solved, they solved really hard problems. They're very smart people. So I do enjoy it. Well, considering what you did last time, then, uh, you know, second time around, it could be uh, just as big. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> watch, watch this space. <laughs> right. Well, but Tom, there's a couple of guys that grew up playing, um, you know, Sega games and uh, were massive fans of the Mega Drive. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing to have you on the show and get your stories. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing them with us. And we're looking well, forward th- to looking at the movie as well. <laughs> well, thank you. So am I. And uh, thanks for having me on the show. And best of luck to you guys. And, and keep up the interest in, uh, in the world of video games.